This is the story of tenacious women who have fought for the value of their work to be recognized. Their victories have led to thousands of women receiving increases in pay. The TUC Equal Pay Oral History Archive records the voices of women and their unions who established the principle of equal pay for work of equal value. Their daughters and granddaughters owe them a debt and we owe it to them to keep fighting. Fighting to end a shocking statistic that for every one pound a man earns, a woman only earns 83 pence. Everybody's job was important, but I didn't, didn't see why women shouldn't be paid, you know, equal pay for work of equal value. And that was one of the biggest stumbling blocks at the beginning, having to make men understand that we weren't trying to put their jobs down or belittle their jobs. But we just needed people to understand, you know, equality. women started talking amongst themselves and saying, well, this is not on. We can sort of turn our hands to anything, but the men can't, which is which seemed very unfair to us. So I think that was the start of us digging our heels in. Us women was doing a qualified job and they just didn't want to pay us the money that we should have had, we should we deserved. seen the um, union guy about it and uh, he said to me it sounds as though it is wrong he'd go and ask the management he went and asked the management and they said no it's classed as a labourer and he argued and said no well why did you send us to college for I can remember one medical officer saying the reason he thought that they were not speech therapists was that because they were all so marriageable. <laughs> they were all intelligent and attractive and marriageable and that's why they were leaving, not because they were not getting paid. <laughs> She just came in one day and said, your terms and conditions are changing, um, you're going to be three pounds an hour and that'll be it. And there was nothing, there was no, everything was taken away. You know, you didn't have to be a staunch unionist or anything like that, you know, they were treating you unfairly, you know, you worked here all these years, that was the one thing that kept coming across it all yeah, the time, it it's yeah. unfair. Unfairly, that is how all these women, hospital cleaners, sewing machinists, dinner ladies, speech therapists and a qualified cook were being treated. They argued their skills were undervalued. With the support of their unions, they stood up and were counted. They took on long struggles to win recognition for the value of their work. But you see, nobody understood really what was happening. It was a whole new world for them too. Mm -hmm. Trying to get through, you know, the idea of quality, you know, on all levels. But Sally, remember the first time we went to court, you were sick. <laughs> Well, yes. physically. Oh, I was. Sally, you weren't, weren't you? I was indeed. <laughs> she took sick every morning before she left the house. Just, the you nurse. just worked yourself up so much about going, you know, and as Mary said, like, you know, management just thought, you shouldn't be doing this, you shouldn't be here, and you felt that when they passed it, they were sort of... But then as time went on, I think they got used to just going to court, we got used to going to court, and... I think we all thought there was never going to be an end to it, so it's sort of a... It was like yesterday's news for a while, you know. The management just sat back and thought, oh, they're going to walk in from there, they're going to walk back from the canteen and they're going to start work. And they were so shocked. And this chap was, was only a young fellow and he'd written something on the lines of, well, these women only come out for pin money or pocket money. 
And he was sat directly in front of me as I was reading this in the tribunal, and I thought, I'm going to smack you. <laughs> <laughs> How dare you insult the ladies who are working? You know, and that, from then on, that's what got me fired, because I thought, you no, know, I'm not. And from a man's age, you know, as somebody in the, the 60s, I could have understood. But for a laddie's age, I thought, you're just talking rubbish, and you how dare you do this to them all? When you thought you'd started something and every time you got so far and you thought you were going to win, you were not back and it made you more determined to go on, to get there. You know, it was like putting a hurdle in front of you and you were going to jump it and get to the next one. With no men doing jobs that were the same or broadly similar, these women relied on male trade unionists to be comparators so that equal value could be established. That man's working out in snow. You can't compare him, same with a, a school meals worker, a, a woman working in a kitchen. Yes, you can, because, OK, one may be cold, but the other one may be very hot, working flat out in such a short time to produce a full meal for not just one child, but hundreds of children in, in, in the bigger schools. When he came to come to follow me round, for a couple of days, I guess I say he had this manager with him who kept saying, oh, no, this, and no, 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 that, and I think, um, you do this and do that, and he was writing things down. Um, when the guy went out in the, in the shipyard and um, had to follow my compatriots around and things, um, the blokes were saying, because the manager was saying, oh, look, they're up, you know, painters are up a big ladder there, painting, and the painters were saying, oh, we, we, we climb that ladder like we get an extra ten bob. Men who worked within the union were always good union members and when they sat at meetings and had it explained to them that we weren't trying to put them down in any way. You know, we explained exactly what it meant, what we were trying to do. These two boys came forward and we were very grateful to them. Mm. Francie and Jared, mm. they were hilarious, but they were really, and they were very honest about their work. They were very honest, just as the women were honest about theirs. My psychologist friend, a great chap who shared details about what they were doing and what they were paid. You know, so there was that much friendship that you knew jolly well that you were not actually being recompensed in the same way. I think, now you'll probably correct me, I think it was something like £7,000. You were on about 11000 at yes, the time? Yes, that's 11, right. £11,000 per yes. annum. And your comparator was on seventeen, eighteen. Something like that? Yes, yes. yes. And, and he, he never bought the drinks. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was enough to make you go to court, really, then. The skills involved in women's jobs were not recognised. Like when we had to go around and uh, look at the work and what we did, I mean, you had well, about 40 pieces on some backs, cushions, like the set. You had 40 different individual pieces. And you had to know exactly where they went. I mean, you put your left and your right, whatever. But if you did, you wasn't a machinist, you wouldn't know where they'd gone, where it went. The change of design comes here. They just put it in front of the machinist, and the machine has never seen it before. Opens it up and puts all the bits and pieces together to make a sleep. Support from many different sources helped the women. All these cases were financially backed by the women's trade union local and national union officials were crucial, as were experts, lawyers and the Equal Opportunities Commission. And that's where having trade union support is so very, very important. They did an excellent job of bringing those women together in the first place and an excellent job of never losing them throughout the entire 15 years. Uh, and I think from starting off from a position where it was a cause for a small group of women, it became a cause for the entire profession. And that's down to the union, that was not down to the ESC. We could not possibly have, uh, have, have done that. And so I was on the picket line with the guys, and because of um, I was involved in the picket line with the guys and things, um, one point when I was doing the case, um, Cameron had said, if I don't go to work, they're going to say that I'm um, bringing it into dispute. Um, so we had to meet outside the gates again. There's like something like two thousand guys, you know, because we're all in different gates. And um, they explained, everybody explained that what I was doing, and they all voted, and everybody voted that you know I go back in. So the this was quite embarrassing actually. One day they there about I think there's about um, three or four thousand of them waited outside the gates, and they all moved to one side and just clapped me in and said, 
you know, you'll do more good in work is far, your struggle and your fight is far more important for us. We had the police from Dagenham Police Station yeah. come down oh, every night to make good. sure we yeah, were all right. Yeah, they used to they? come down just to make sure we was right. Yeah. And they used to come down, didn't mm. they? And you could say if you want Pam. <laughs> they used to bring us a bottle of whiskey down yeah. there. <laughs> Now and again to keep us warm. <laughs> but it was this one particular sore. police man. He's no, always think... come down. He, but they looked after us well, during Pam the night. Well, Pam was single, and I think this particular policeman <laughs> fancied her, actually. So. <laughs> uh. With the help of their unions, these women, after long years of struggle, won recognition for the value of their work. And I was very proud of the rest of the women, because you didn't even have to ask them. I just no. looked around and everybody said, no, that was it, unanimous decision, no. That wasn't the idea behind it. It wasn't just to get money for five women, it was to get for everybody. It was to get justice for everybody. And that's what you pay union dues for, that's what you pay things for, for those people to fight your cases for you, to do things. Um, and that's where the collective power of people being together can make things happen. And that's, I think, one of the importance of unions is collectively people can make change. Right across the country, people started putting in similar cases and won them. But these two did that. Yes. It was these two that did that, and that's, did. you've got to get a kick out of that. Oh, yeah. yeah. You created a legal right. precedent, you changed legislation, you stopped mm. employers from cutting pay to win contracts, you stopped them from using market forces as an argument to cut your pay. Mm -hmm. They did that. <laughs> with, <laughs> with your help, though. Yes, yeah, with, with your help. With your help. Yeah. I mean, I would, your I wouldn't, support and everything, yeah, wouldn't I mean, yeah. we wouldn't have known where to start. Well. No. 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 Without the union behind us. You know, oh, I mean, that's right. It, it was a good and, team. Yeah. That's what I used to say to everybody, you know, join the union because if there's any problems, that's the only way you're going to get anything sorted. I've got two really good friends out <laughs> <laughs>